Good morning. Good Good to see so many of you, considering it was snowy and cold this morning. Who knew? End of March. Thought it was supposed to be in like a lion and out like a lamb, but I think it got its corners crossed. So getting some snow and cold. We have quite a few announcements. This Saturday is the Presbyterian Women's Soup Sale pickup time. That is from 10 to 1 p.m., I believe. If you have not made your order yet, you still can. And if you have anyone you know, let them know today. They can even just go to our website and order it there. They wouldn't have to call anybody or anything. That way we can get as much soup sold as possible. But if you're looking to pick it up, or you have a friend that you know did an order, remind them that's this Saturday. And again, that's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Our next Breck and Bread service will be not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday evening. That is going to be just the service. So don't plan for dinner that night. This one is just a evening worship service. We also have a Monday, Thursday service this year. We're going to be partnering with Bethesda and Olivet once again. It's been a bit of time. A little COVID messed everything up, but we're finally getting back together again. And we're going to be the ones hosting. Uh, That is going to be April 14th at 7 p.m. So if you're looking to wonder, what Monday, Thursday service could I go to for Easter? Right here. It's going to be here. Walt's going to be preaching. It'll be a wonderful time to celebrate with our sister congregations just down the street and across the river once again. There's also a Good Friday service that's going to be at Bethesda at noon as usual on that Friday. Round Hill Presbyterian Church is also doing an evening song and reflection on April 6th. That's a Wednesday before all Holy Week. That's also in your announcements here. And as always, today is our Backyard Ministry Day. It's the end of the month. If you're looking to help us pack, that will be wonderful. Stay after church. We're going to be postponing delivery of it till this Tuesday after Bible study at 11. The weather's just not really conducive for it today, and it just seemed better for everybody to do it on a different day. Still in March, so we're good there. So if you're looking to help deliver, we'll be doing that Tuesday at 11 p.m. But we're still going to be packing everything up today following church. Are there any other announcements besides the fact that it's Bonnie's birthday. So happy birthday, Bonnie. Thank you. And if we want to sing, we can. Oh. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Always good to have you, Bonnie. Any other announcements this week? That was quite a few, and seeing no others, let us join our hearts and minds together and come to God in worship through prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that although it may have been cold and a bit of snow, we were able to gather safely. We pray for those that are feeling unwell today, for those who are part of our congregation that cannot make it, that you lift them up into your presence this morning and help them know that they were always with us and that we can worship together. Guide our hearts and minds, may your spirit come upon us and make this worship glorifying to your name. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with me our first hymn today, A New Name and Glory, number 417. Was freely given. And- 
may be seated. Turn in our hearts and minds to God as we come to our time of confession. We do so knowing that his grace welcomes us home no matter how far we may have run. Would you please join me in our prayer of confession this morning? God of grace, help us see the ways we harbor jealousy of others. We wrongly compare ourselves to others, letting anger and distrust cloud our hearts. Clutching after things of this world, we lose sight of your love. May your spirit give us strength to set aside our jealous hearts and learn to trust in you. Amen. Beloved, the grace of God has been given to you, and you are held in the assured power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name you are forgiven. Would you please stand and join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, today. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits in the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. To turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer, we'll remember those who are unable to be with us. We'll pray for Diana and her mother, as Diana's feeling just a little unwell today, and Janora still continue to recover from her headaches. Bonnie? And that's for his surgery, correct? Well, I think Bonnie goes along with it, but yes, we'll be praying for Joe's surgery and Bonnie's mental well-being as we go through this hard week. Any other requests? Seeing none, let us turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we gather this day, the people who have run into your arms knowing that we were sinners, knowing that we are sinners and that we stand here because of your grace for us for your love for us that welcomes each of us here into your presence despite all we may have done and all the ways we might fail, that you look on us with love, that you are a God who reigns from heaven, not with anger, but mercy, that you are a God who looks on the world and sees the ways that we break it, and your heart breaks too, the one who made this creation to be enjoyed, and yet we squander, that we gather up, and grow jealous of others and seek after more ourselves instead of being willing to share all that you give and bless us with. You are the one who will right the wrongs that we see. You are the judge of all. And in the end, you are the God who chooses grace and love and compassion and seeks to build a new kingdom where all can be. So Lord, give us eyes to see a world as you see it. Give us hearts and minds to be your people that see the tragedies and desire to work that they may never come again, that see the heartaches and seek to be there for those who are wounded. Give us hearts, give us desire, give us energy and vigor and imagination to build your kingdom here and now. We pray for your church that you've placed in all corners of this world, that you would renew our spirits, that you would help us be clear hands and feet, disciples that serve others, and not ourselves. We pray that you give us faith to be content with all that we have, that we might give the overabundance that we have to others, to change the world for the better. Lord, we pray for the conflicts that we see, particularly in Ukraine. We pray for the continuing struggle, the political dynamics, but primarily this day, we pray for all those who are suffering, for the innocents, for the wounded, the crushed, the undeserving of this atrocity. 
We pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that your justice would be done, that healing would come and peace reign. We pray for the tragedies we see around us here, for those who are left behind, for those who are sick and hurt. We pray that no voice would be left unheard, no person forgotten, that we would each come to know of your grace and kingdom, to see your open arms that welcome all. So, Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for your blessings to be there for our families and our friends and our neighbors. But we even pray more that your blessings would flow out on those who are left behind, the strangers, the outcasts, the homeless, the shut-ins, the weary, the wounded, those who have served in the medical field for so long without seeing an end in sight, those who serve and seek justice despite all the things that go on around them. We know that your care and love extends to each person. Where there might be sorrow, sickness, or suffering, send your spirit to bring comfort and healing. Lord, we pray for Bonnie this week. We pray that you'd be with her. Lord, we pray that you would be with Joe in his surgery, that your healing hands would guide the surgeons and direct their hearts and minds and give them strength. We pray for Diana. We pray for Janora. We pray for all those who we know are struggling. We pray for Sherry Tiganelli, that you give strength to her legs. We pray for the many names on our prayer list. We pray for all those that are on our hearts and minds. And so in this time of silence, we lift up to you those things that weigh upon our hearts, those distractions that seek to rob us of our focus on you. But all these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather this morning, we give from the blessings we have that others might be blessed as well. Would you please join me in our morning offering?
join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. Holy Spirit, bless these offerings to help those who are lost see your love for them. Amen. And join me in singing our second hymn today. That's what we'll walk up here for. Great, greater than our sin. Number 394. come to our first scripture reading, we'll be reading Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, in whom whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. And our New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. 
and then we're going to jump to verse 11 and read a very familiar parable. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the paws that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he gave, but when he came to himself, He said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to eat and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far away off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now... His elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother's come, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, For all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. And you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord for us this day. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. To me, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yes.
When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, Lie, you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie, you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Pray with me. Lord, may the meditations of our hearts, and the words that I speak this morning, be glorifying to you. I pray that your spirit will come upon us, that we may each learn how to better be your disciples in this world, to teach us what you desire us to learn and grow in our faith. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Well, we continue on our journey through discipleship. And I'll remind us that we are doing this as a focus on Lent, a time of discipleship where we focus and discern what it is that we do in our lives. Lent is a particular time to set aside, often through giving up certain things, or to take on certain things, to better reflect and focus our hearts on mind in preparation of Holy Week, in preparation of Easter, which is quickly approaching. And this year we're taking a look at modern faces of roadblocks and challenges to discipleship. And this week we come to jealousy. This week we have a very, very famous parable before us. One many of you are probably quite familiar with. The prodigal son. There's paintings of this story. There's statues 
of this story because it's a beautiful story. And it very well illustrates the great grace of God that no matter how far you might run, no matter what you might do or say to God, if he sees you on the road ever so slightly coming home, God will run out with abandon to come to you and pour love upon you. It's a beautiful parable. But what we often miss when reading the prodigal son is that that's not the end of the story. And we also have to remember that the prodigal son is set in a context. And it's good that our lectionary opened us up to that context. We are seeing that Jesus is saying this parable to Pharisees, to teachers of the law, to the religious authority of his time, because they're not happy with the people he's hanging out with. They're not happy that this prophet from God is going to sinners, to the undeserving. And so he says two other parables before this, one of lost sheep, of a lost coin, and the very famous parable here. And you get that beautiful passage, the one that teaches us that we all recognize and see in our own lives, that we have run far, that we also stumble and fall, that sometimes we make mistakes and sin, and that as all Christians, we recognize that we've been forgiven, that grace has been poured on us, that all that we talk about in many ways culminates on that Easter day when everything's been given for us, that the things we do are out of reflection of the love that God already has for us, that we didn't deserve it, that we got it as a free gift. It encapsulates so much. But then we stop there all too often. We think of this story as a happy ending between father and son embracing and a sacrifice being made, and we think that's the picture, that's it. But as we know in our lives, that's not often the end of our stories. That's actually kind of the beginning of our Christian life, is it not? When we first come to Christ, we came running, or maybe we grew up in the church and we grew in our faith. But at a certain point, we recognized and we felt that love that God had for us. But then our lives kept going. And we grew in our faith. And we continued to be faithful sons and daughters. And this is where we come to a reflection for us. This challenge that I want to pose toward our faith. This modern faith that permeates all times and places. That there's nothing new about this. And that is the problem of the older son. Because the story of the prodigal son is about two sons, not just one. See, there's the first that ran away, that took everything from the father, that said, I want my inheritance now, and ran off. But then there's a second son, is there not? One who stayed, one who was faithful who, as he says, obeyed you like a slave, did everything you asked of me. I didn't ask for the inheritance early. I didn't spit in your face by asking for such a thing. I honored you. And what happens when his brother comes home? What happens when he sees his father pour out that beautiful grace we just talked about, that wonderful thing? He gets jealous. He lets anger creep into his heart. He sees all that his brother's getting and thinks, he doesn't deserve that. He wasn't here the whole time. How come he's getting those things from God and I'm not? How come my father's being nice to him when he didn't do anything to deserve it? And so the father has to leave his house once again. So you might miss it, but the dad has to go out to both children in the fields. The first one he ran to on the road, and the second one he leaves the house again to come bring him in. And he tells him, we had to do this thing, for your brother was lost, and now he's found. And that's where the parable ends. See, we don't get to know how the older son responds, do we? Jesus doesn't say, and then the older son came to his senses, and he embraced his father and went inside. Because he might not. He might instead say, that's all in good and well. You have your party, Dad. 
but I'm going to take what's mine when the time comes, and I'm not going to embrace this brother that you call mine. See, he could look at it that way. We don't get to know the answer because Jesus is posing this parable to the exact people who represent the older brother. Remember, this parable set when he's talking to Pharisees and tax collectors. All, no, Pharisees and teachers of the law. The lost brother is all the sinners, the prostitutes, those who are dead in their ways, the tax collectors, all the people that at that time period when Jesus was serving, that all the people in the law would say, they don't deserve your grace, God. They haven't come to our temple in a long time. They've been doing all sorts of bad things. They haven't been cleaned. They don't respect our religious rules. They don't deserve your grace and love, God. We do, Jesus. We're your chosen people, Jesus. Stop eating with them. And so, the younger son, the son we often associate with, is all the sinners. Jesus in God is representative of the Father, and the older son are the religious authority. But how much more often in our lives, when we've been Christians quite a while, or just for a little bit, Start to get those feelings that cross into our minds when we see others not deserving of things. They haven't come to church in a long time. How come their lives seem to be so much better than mine? They aren't being faithful to God, and yet they're doing well. How come that new religious thing down the street, which hasn't served in this community at all, hasn't been here for a while, seems to be doing so well, and we aren't. How come they have all those things that we don't? The nicer TVs, the better light systems, faithful people, better volunteers. How come that church, which doesn't deserve it, gets it, and we don't? And you can put it in your personal life, too. Because this roadblock of jealousy often creeps up in how we view the world. How come those people are getting such things? They don't deserve those nice things. I deserve nice things. I work hard. I do all I'm supposed to do. I never stepped out of line. I never stole anything. Where's my big house? Where's my money? Where's the things that I deserve? We're not supposed to give handouts to those people. They don't deserve it. We're not supposed to give those things. Give it to the people that worked hard. Give it to the people that have been there and done the right stuff. Jealousy. Anger. Frustration. These are roadblocks and challenges to our discipleship. Because in this story, while what the first son did was horrible, he at least came to his senses, and when he came home, saw God's grace for him. But the second son did just as poorly, and we don't know if he came to his senses. And in many ways, as we look at this, if the Pharisees and, and teachers of the law are representative, we know that they failed the test, because in the end, they couldn't accept Jesus. What will happen to us in our lives, if we grow cold and angry and jealous of those around us in our religious lives, of what we do, well, more than likely we'll wind up like the Pharisees and those religious authority, washed away, forgotten. So what is the antidote to this challenge? Because it will come up in your life, in your walk of faith. It might not happen now, but it will creep in. And the danger of it is that it is very nefarious. It'll start out as this little thing in the back of your head, that seed of jealousy. You'll see something and be like, ah, oh, I really wish I had that. They didn't deserve to get that thing. And what happens is you then start to seek after it yourself. You start to want it all the more. You focus on it so much. The problem of jealousy see, isn't so much getting the thought is how it distracts you from God's service. It's how it distracts you from the grace you've already been given. It's how it slowly pulls you away to focus on the world 
instead of God. It causes you not to think of the grace you've been given or the blessings you have or satisfaction and contentment with what you've been given by God and instead crave after more and more and more. That's what jealousy does. It seeps in with a little bit to make you want more. Well, the antidote is a very difficult thing. Simple word, contentment. That's all you got to do. You got to be content. But I'm going to tell you this, in our modern era, being content is one of the most difficult things you'll ever do. Because it's the exact opposite from what the world is telling you to be. See, jealousy is the problem, and the antidote's contentment. But the modern face is how the world tells you not to be content. How the modern world tells you, you need the bigger house. You need the nicer car. You need the better job. You need the government to give you these things. You need those people to help you. You need this. You need that. Nicer clothes. Better boots. Doesn't matter. We are bombarded on a daily basis by advertisements, by a culture of consumerism, and our ever-growing need for more things. Just 30 years ago, cell phones didn't exist. Now, it's something everybody needs. You need it. You got to have it. Well, do you? Maybe, actually. Internet didn't exist 50 years ago, and now it does. Do you need it? Probably to live in this modern age. And so our definitions of contentment change. The struggle as Christians is to learn to know what is something that we need and something that we just want. And to, to define that line in our lives is a very difficult thing to do. And I'm not telling you that you can't desire a nice car. I'm not telling you that you can't work hard. You can't ask God to bless you. But what you can't do is grow despondent, jealous, angry, or frustrated if those nicer things don't come. We have to be willing to say, Lord, I would love if your blessings came upon me. I pray that you will make my family grow, that we would gain in wealth and prosperity. But I am content to know that you know things better than I am. I will be satisfied with what you give me, and that I will know that is all I need. See, that's the delicate balance. You might want more, and you can pursue it, and that's good. Grow, gather things, flourish. God wants to bless us. That is a through line throughout the Bible. God wants blessing. He wants flourishing in your life. But what he doesn't want is you to grow greedy, to grasp after it, or to grow angry when other people's blessings are more. Because here's a fact. There's never an end to God's blessing. When you read through Scripture, what happens is people clutch after God's blessing, thinking there's only so much to have. And they fight over it. And they cheat over it. And they lie over it. And God's sitting back going, I could give it to both of you. We instead go, no, no, that's not how the world works. Well, God doesn't play by the world's rules. God's grace isn't fair. Because God's grace is there for everybody. God wants to bless you. But the challenge to our discipleship, our walks of faith, is to learn when is it that we're just being jealous? When is it that all we're doing is pursuing our ends and not God's ends? Where is my balance of my desires and my needs? What we need to do to challenge our jealous hearts is to be content in a God who is enough. See, the second son's error was the fact that he forgot that it wasn't all the things his dad had that made him special. It was the fact that he had a dad who loved him, and that was all he needed. His error was being jealous of all the things that his younger brother had, of all the things his brother wasted, of all the things that God might be giving that first son. 
and that might not give in to him. But it's just stuck. And he lost sight of that. He lost sight of his brother. Because that's another danger to jealousy, is when you let it change how you look at others and stop wanting to help them. Stop wanting them to come. Stop wanting to be there for them. Because that's what happened to the second son. As he phrases it in Scripture, that son of yours. When you get down to it, that is a horrible thing for him to say. He didn't say, my brother. He said, that son of yours. Because I've disowned him. I don't want anything to do with him. I hate him. Because when you let jealousy seep in with its tiny words, when you let it make your life revolve around needing more, all you'll learn to do is hate others. It leads to an inevitable road of us dividing, hating, and anger. And the antidote, when God turns to that older son and says, but we had to celebrate, we had to celebrate, not I had to celebrate, we did because of this brother of yours. When we grow content with what God has in our lives, we can learn to see others for who and what they are. Our brothers and sisters, fellow siblings in Christ. We can learn to look at the humanity of others, that each and every one of us is equal in God and Christ. That when God looks at the world, he doesn't see the Nevins. He doesn't see the Carol Jean McKenzie and the Bill Mowers. He doesn't see the Minerds. He doesn't see the Schneiders. He sees us. He doesn't see this church or that church. He sees us. He doesn't see black, brown, white, yellow. He sees us. And in our jealous hearts, we're the ones that divide. We're the ones that say, you don't deserve that. You shouldn't be getting that. And we grow to separate. When we grow to be content in who we are, content that God is enough for us, content in our faith, we then have a better chance at saying, I love you. We have a better chance at changing the world for the better. We have a better chance at sharing all that we have and being happy for others when God blesses them. To share in the blessings they have and for us to share the blessings we have. So let us learn to challenge this insidious space of jealousy. Grow in your life and faith. That is what we're to do. I challenge you this week to look and reflect in your hearts where you might be harboring jealousy. Because it is nefarious. It will tell you that it's okay to feel this way. But it's not. Let us not become like that older brother. Let us not become cold and hard and hateful. Let us learn to be more like the Father. Let us learn to be more like Jesus that sits with sinners, eats with tax collectors, and says, all are welcome here. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I thank you for the love you have for us. That you are a Father that comes and is with us with open arms. That despite where we might run to, you are near. And despite how we might grow cold and jealous, you still come out to meet us where we are. That you are a God that meets us in both places and wakes us up to the truth of your love and grace. So help us learn then, Lord, to be your children, to be that light in the world, to act like you, to set aside jealousy and be content that we might better love recklessly the world around us. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with me our final hymn? And you'll note it's a little different. We're going to sing the first verse, the chorus, the second and third verse, and then the chorus once again. God sent his son. Oh.
old fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn pride and joy he gives and but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because Christ lives and then one day I'll cross that bridge Fight life's fine, old war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He reigns because He lives. I can face tomorrow. I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Go this week knowing that God loves you. No matter where you might run, no matter what you might have done, no matter how you might grow jealous, he loves you and he is there to welcome you home. So go in the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the strength of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.